Hi, welcome to Visual Studio Toolbox. I'm your host, Robert Green, and joining me today is Omer Raviv. Hello, hey, Omer. Congratulations on the perfect pronunciation, Robert. Thank you. Omer is here to talk about OzCode, which is just about one of the coolest extensions invented. It uh, helps with debugging, and it's, it is amazing. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, we talk a lot on this show about coding. We talk a lot about the tooling. We've talked about testing. Um, but we haven't spent perhaps as much time on debugging your code. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And you're going to show us how OzCode really helps with that. Exactly. So when you think about it, it's kind of funny. We spend at least, if we're honest with ourselves, about 50% of our time debugging. Mm -hmm. But nobody really teaches you um, how do you apply the best possible debugging practices, right? It's extremely, the thing about debugging is it's extremely hard, it's extremely frustrating. Yeah. It's a huge challenge both intellectually and psychologically because in order to be successful at debugging, we need to be very rigorously methodical. I call it applying the scientific method religiously. Yeah, right? and it's, it's a total context switch. Like if, you, if your code doesn't work, right, because you typed something wrong, mm -hmm. right? Oh, that's not what I expected to go look at the code. Oh, I see why. Change the code. You're in that kind of mode of writing code. But when you can't see why in your code there's a problem. Now it's a total context switch. You go from something that you control to stuff that's going on under the covers, per perhaps. You've lost control, uh, potentially, and it's, it's a massive, potentially a massive uh, switch in, in the way you think. Absolutely. So I'm going to show you some tools today that sort of make it less clear Am I coding or am I debugging? We're kind of mm -hmm. stretching the lines a bit. Cool. Um, and we're going to give you these tools that will hopefully give you a much easier way to understand the root cause of each bug. Because that's the thing about debugging. Like you try to fix the same problem for an hour, and then yeah. another hour, yeah. and then another hour, and you keep on failing. And that's where you get into that zombie mode of debugging, where you're just sort of staring blankly at the computer screen, hitting F10, F10, F10. Yeah. And if somebody look, walks through, they'll, they'll see, like, you have no idea what you're doing. You're right. just mindlessly stepping through code. So yeah. these tools are meant to give you an understanding of the root cause of each bug. Because another thing that happens all too often is that we don't, because debugging is so hard, um, rather than fixing, like understanding the real root cause of the bug, we end up fixing some manifestation or some symptom of it, and we sort of put a little band aid on it and call it fixed yep. um, and move on with our lives. Um, and I'm going to show you a bunch of visual ways to understand what's happening on the okay. code. Let's see them. Cool. So I'm going to jump into Visual Studio. And we're going to look at uh, the progression of how OzCode has changed from version 3 to version uh, 4, this, the new version that's coming out. So this is a whoops. So this is a feature from version 3.5. I'm going to show you, which is the search feature. So the search uh, has been magically improved in version 3.5. So I have a large collection of customer objects. I don't want to have to open this up and scroll through it because that would be extremely time-consuming and opening all of these guys and finding that. Let's say I'm looking for a Michael. Rather than scroll and open up a bunch of, of these guys, which you will take me all day. You can search through that collection? I can just search. Oh, my goodness. Amazing. <laughs> you sold me. We're done. We're done. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, so actually, cool. search is some, yeah. And mm -hmm. search is something that's always been in a part of OzCode. Um, but now in version 3.5, it's really improved. So the first thing you'll notice is we've got these automatic suggestions. So I'm searching for Michael. It tells me there's a Michael. There's a Michael Ford, a Michael E. Ford. When I hit Enter, it will basically work just like uh, it works in Google Chrome. Every time I hit Enter, it, it shows me the correct results. And when I uh, click the Filter button, it will show me just the results that I actually want to see. Now, the cool thing here is that once I perform that initial search, basically OzCode has gone through and extracted the entire collection. It indexed all of it with a, a Lucene.net. We're using the uh, .NET open source indexing library. So now when I type stuff in here, it will go there real, real quick. Um, and I can actually get some insight just from typing stuff in. For example, we see that there's a gender property. Mm -hmm. If I type in female, just by typing that in, I already get the insight that there are 12 hits for the word female in here. Uh, and if I type in male, I immediately see, OK, I've got 18 hits for male. So I can see all of these results extremely quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can search through the, the, the property names, the values. It doesn't matter. 
OK, so that was searching. A cool new feature in Oscode version 3.5. Okay. Um, another nice thing about searching, by the way, is that there's some advanced things. So initially, when we search for something, let's search for Michael again, uh, you'll see that it only searches two levels deep into my object graph. But every time I click this button right here, it, it searches deeper and deeper into my collection. Another option we have here is this guy right here at the bottom. And what that does, it basically allows you to only uh, uh, search for fields and auto properties. What, what that does, why that's important, is that sometimes uh, we have uh, some problems in debugging where the debugger works too slow. And it's sort of uh, uh, you end up waiting a lot of time, and then it finally times out. Mm -hmm. That happens when somebody writes a property getter in their C-sharp code that does does a ton of things, like it goes after the database and destroys the world and all of that. Right. And, and when you get that experience, it doesn't matter if you're using Oscode or the Visual Studio Debugger, you'll have a really hard time debugging. Mm -hmm. So when you want to search for some, so through a collection if, and you see that you have a problem with those properties, you can enable this button right here. And that will only search for fields and auto properties, not execute any actual properties. Uh, and even if you have uh, miswritten mis, uh, property getters, that will still work for you. Cool. Um, the other cool feature in Oscode version uh, 3.1, actually, is a feature where you can export stuff from the debugger into a unit test or an integration test. And that's extremely useful if you're using live unit testing, which is one of my favorite new features yes, in the Visual Studio absolutely. Debugger. Uh, in the Visual Studio uh, 2017. Um, let's say I've been debugging for two hours now. And I've tried to put a breakpoint here, tried to put a breakpoint there. Eventually, I find this one particular object, the slowest, which is the one that's causing the system to crash. Okay. And now I want to create a unit test or an integration test or even just a throwaway console app that has this particular data in it. Okay. Because um, that's really the best one of the best ways to make sure you're not spending too much time in that zombie mode of debugging we talked mm -hmm. about is if you're able to min um, find a minimal reproduction for your bug and then put that bug inside of a unit test or integration test because that's essentially like trapping the bug in a room that has no doors and no windows, right? It's got nowhere to go. Okay. So what we're gonna do here, we're gonna go over to this magic wand and the magic wand is sort of like the bearer of good news. This is Oscode telling you there's all sorts of useful things you could be doing with this particular object. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna click on export. So when I do that, Oscode basically writes out a textual representation of this object as C sharp code. So it just mm -hmm. writes all the C sharp code for me. Now I can copy this to clipboard, paste it into my unit test, and I'm pretty much up and going in just seconds, right? Uh, I can also have this output as XML or as JSON using JSON.net, uh, the yeah. NewtonSoft JSON mm -hmm. serializer, which is the one everybody's using. Uh, and I can save this to file and have my unit test uh, open, uh, deserialize from that file, or just send that file over email to somebody to look, take cool. a look at. So that's exporting uh, stuff from the debugger. So now what I'd like to, to go ahead and talk to you on is the Oscode version 4, the all, all exciting right. brand new Oscode that's coming out soon. Um, and the cool new thing about Oscode version 4 is we've made edit and continue just a whole lot more fun uh, to use. And look what happens here. So this is what happened just now is a bit subtle and a bit startling. I just hit a breakpoint right here on this line of code. Okay. And Oscode has already went ahead and predicted everything that's going to happen up until the very end of this method. Mm. Okay. What do you mean by that? What I mean is that Oscode is able to predict what's going to, uh, to, go to happen in your code. We're running this code inside of an IL interpreter such that we're able to actually figure out everything that's going to happen. And then we can give you both a time travel and a live coding experience on top of that. So I note that my yellow line of the debugger where the instruction pointer here my, is, my current execution point, is all the way up here at the very beginning of my method. Mm -hmm. I can already see everything that's going to happen. I'm going to see that this guy is going to return a certain GIF, what this method is going to return. By the way, nobody bothered to implement the toString method on GIF, so, but I can fix that by just starring the name property. And then I can immediately pop that up to the top there. Um, now I can see that what each line of code is going to be doing. I'm going to I see what this method is going to return. Now another thing you'll notice here is that because I'm inside of a time travel debugging experience, I can see uh, the values at the current time of execution. What does that mean? So right now, because the the, line, the yellow line is up here, if I was using the normal Visual Studio debugger, 
when I hover over total price, I'd get a zero here, right? Because we only initialize the variable total price up here in this line of code. But here I see that, OK, here total price is 51. That's because we've added uh, 30 to uh, 21. Now all these annotations you see up that are telling you the values of everything, they're optional, right? So um, th this is sort of like a code lens for the Visual Studio debugger. But I can turn it on and off and just use these uh, the data tip to see what everything did, right? And then I can click these glasses to see the information. Whoops, uh, to see the information uh, when I need it. So, what's the benefit of telling me ahead of time what you predict is going to happen versus me just stepping through this and then seeing what happened? That's a wonderful question. So most of the time when you're talking about a time travel debugging experience, you're talking about going back to the, to the past to see what happened before right. because you already forgot. Um, I'm going to tell you uh, in this in terms of a TV show from the 90s. You know that show? I really liked it when I was growing up about that guy who gets the newspaper, yet, uh, tomorrow's newspaper every day, and then he goes and runs off and, and fixes whatever is going to happen. So he doesn't just make money off it. He goes and helps the planet. Apparently, that's okay. what you do. <laughs> yeah. Oh, OK. Um, but getting back here, what this means is that if we see that the debug is going to happen, like this wasn't supposed to be shipping cost. It was actually supposed to be shipping cost times, times 10. We can just do that. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as I lift my fingers off the keyboard, boom, it updates and tells me uh, what's going to happen. So it updated okay. both here and updated here. So edit and continue has just become 10 times better because I don't need to even apply my changes and run the code forward to see how my changes are going to take effect. I see it as soon as I lift my fingers off the keyboard. Oh, cool. So now if I, for example, introduce a divide by 0, uh, boom, there's a divide by 0. Nice. And if I call here a method that's going to throw, oops, a method that's going to throw an exception, boom, it updates and tells me, well, this is going to throw an exception. Um, now, the other way in which this is a lot better than the normal debugging experience is that let's say I want to go in here and say, what did the get, why did the get extra freebies cost return 517? Uh, let's say that's a mistake. I want to see what's happening inside this method. It's pretty expensive freebies. Yeah, a lot of really expensive <laughs> freebies. Uh, they, they went too far. There's no such thing as a freebie, apparently. <laughs> apparently not. So the way you would do this in the normal debugger is you'd probably hit F10, 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 F10. You yep. step all the way down to the bottom of the method, which is already pretty frustrating because we've all, all that experience like a million times where you step too far and then you're like, oh, damn. Now I'm going to have to rerun the entire program just to get back to where I was. Well, with o the Oz code tooling, you don't need to do that. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to hit F12 just like you would if you're trying to go to definition. Mm -hmm. But we actually did go to execution right now. Ooh. What that means is that Oscode highlighted this method call. And it's showing me what that method, not just the code of this method, but what the actual execution of this method did right here. Mm -hmm. Okay, So that's really, really useful because I can just go, I don't have to go back and forth and rerun the program again and again. I can just, now let's say I want to see, wait, why did is eligible for this count return false for this guy? I can just hit F12 and we'll see that the method appears up here and I can see, well, here we're only uh, giving discounts to customers who spend at least $2,000 each year and this guy did not, he spent less than $2,000. Okay. So I can basically time travel, see everything that happened and this also updates the, uh, the visual branching that we can see. So every, you can see that everything that returned false is true, uh, is green and, and everything that's false is red. Uh. And if I want to, let's say, change this so that int try parse will return false. So I'm going to go ahead and say uh, this, blah, 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 like so. Um, now you see that as soon as I lifted my finger off the keyboard, both it updated to show me that try parse return false, but it also de-emphasized this if statement because we're not going to go there anymore. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So there you go. I can time travel debugging. Wow. So um, are there scenarios where, what happens in a scenario where the code you're going to be running actually makes a permanent change, writes to a database or writes to a file? Mm -hmm. When you, you're running the code ahead of time, mm -hmm. right? So what, what happens in a situation where the code that's going to be run that hasn't been run yet 
actually makes physical changes? That's a perfect question. So that is the one limitation of this feature, right? So if I were to go ahead in here, and do any sort of thing that has side effects to the external world. Right. I can say console.readline, uh, for example. And now what you'll see is we just update, and we see the results only up until this point. Okay. But if I hit F10 past the console.readline, I'll be able to actually uh, see the results. Okay. So that's the, the thing that's going to work for you there. The other thing that's going to help you with that is the a new uh, step back functionality that, that Microsoft has announced at Build. If you saw uh, Casey Anderson's wonderful talk about uh, supercharging your debugger. Mm -hmm. um, she showed that the next version of Visual Studio is going to have a step back button. So you can, if you hit a, a breakpoint at the beginning of your code and you hit another breakpoint, let's say after that console.read line, you'll be able to step back and go get back to see all this information Oscode is giving you beforehand. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Now, the other thing that's really helpful with time travel debugging here is the ability to uh, go into a, a for each loop and see all the different iterations and time travel between them. So I've got a for each loop right here. Now you'll notice again that um, this is a list of customers that I'm for eaching over, but nobody mm -hmm. bothered to implement toString on customer. But that's not a problem at all. I'm just going to go ahead and say star the first name and the ID. And from this moment on, Oscode will always remember that first name and ID is what I want to see whenever I'm looking at a customer object. Um, oh, by the way, I can even take cool. this experience to the extreme. So let's say every customer has an address, and mm -hmm. every address has a zip code. And I'd really like to see the zip code for each and every one of these customers. And I don't want to expand each one individually. Yeah. I can just start the nested property, the zip code, inside the address, and then start the address inside the customer. Nice. And there we go. Da -da. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. Um, so now let's look at this time travel debugging experience here. So Oscode is telling me um, that wow, I, I wish I wish I had seen this a month ago. <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> so uh, Oscode is telling me uh, um, what the current item in the for each loop is. It's telling me I've got 30 items in this uh, for each loop. Mm -hmm. It's telling me uh, that the current one, uh, Don, uh, it's going to go here into this case clause. So the other case clause is de-emphasized for me, right? Okay. And these numeric annotations here basically tell me how did I get here, like. We have 18 times within, in, inside these 30 customers that we went into this case clause. So if I want to see, wait, how does this code inside of this case clause behave, I just pick one of the customer that ended up in this case clause, and I can see exactly what happened. I can see that um, some customers, so this code is in charge of sending gifts to customers, but some customers are only going to get a thank you, a measly okay. thank you letter. And we've been getting complaints from customers that are not satisfied with their gift and they feel that they've been screwed. Uh, and we want to debug it and see why that, that happens. Um, so, first thing you can see here is that I can navigate between all these 18 items, that, which are the ones that went inside of this case clause. Or I can go in here and navigate between all the ones who went inside of this case clause. Mm. Um, now, you notice that I also have a pretty complicated if statement here. Mm -hmm. um, now, first of all, if I, uh, Oscode is telling me what is true and what is false, and I can actually hover over this and get the data tip and see the get yearly earnings method returned only this number, which is not larger than that number. That's why this is false. And here, the membership label uh, level was B plus. That's why this returned false, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. Um, but if I want to see, wait, I want to see all the items where this if statement returned true or this uh, if statement returned false. I can just hover over this guy. Uh -huh. This tells me there are 12 instances within the 30 uh, customers which we for each over where this if statement returned true. Right? Now, I can go and actually time travel to each one of those, or I can filter and see just the ones where the if statement returned false, or just the ones where the if statement returned true. Now, another really convenient way to do time travel, let's look inside of this else clause. So I see I've got six instances, six customers where I went inside this uh, uh, else clause. Um, now, let's, and we're sending a thank you letter based on the email. Let's say uh, I want to uh, pivot my time travel de debugging experience based on the email. What that means is I can just hover over this guy, this guy's email, and then hover over this, and this shows me what customer.get email address returned for in each one of these. Uh, so in the fifth iteration, it returned this email. In the ninth iteration, it returned that email, et cetera, et cetera. And I can just click on these guys, and then it will navigate inside this, this, uh, uh, this debugging experience. Wow. 
Now, the other thing that's really cool when I'm stepping through a for each loop is that sometimes the actual bug is not inside the for each loop, but rather a method that the for each loop calls. So let's go, for example, to the uh, send gift method here. Um, and I'm just going to hit F12. Oscode knows that I'm in time travel debugging mode. So instead of doing a go to definition, it did go to execution. So I can see the execution of this code right here. And now I can actually go and when I time travel inside of the outer for each loop in the method that, that's calling, the callee method will also update to show me, well, if, if, it, if it didn't get called, it's all grayed out. And if it did get called, it showed me what actually happened, how this particular in instance of this method was executed. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> it's amazing. Thank you so much. So the next thing I want to talk about is the really exciting announcement that everybody's been waiting for, or at least I've been yeah, waiting for. This announcement, we should just go to us. Yeah. We've got this. We're in this the new version of wow. the studio. Just uh, I love doing behind the scenes. Mm. And I can go video, screen. I can do picture in picture. So you guys let me know. I've been doing a little bit of picture in picture. And I'm interested in your uh, viewers' opinion on whether or not you like that. So if we're doing code and I do picture in picture, do you like that or is it annoying? So just in the show notes, let me know. Perfect. So I'm going to show you um, a, a new experience we're working on at Oscode, okay. which is a collaborative debugging experience. Um, so what that means. So everything you've showed us so far is in version 4? No, uh, yeah, uh, version 4. Four, which is available now? No, which is coming soon. Coming soon, OK. Um, and some of the, the search functionality that I showed you at the very beginning is version, and the export functionality as well are already available as part of version 3.5 okay. that's out right now. Okay. Um, I'm next, I'm going to show you uh, the link debugging experience that is version 3. It's already available. That's the version we sim shipped on the very same day that Visual Studio 2017 came out. Okay. And then we're going to look at a brand new thing, which is the Oscode Cloud Debugger, which allows me to basically collaborate with other colleagues on debugging through their favorite web browser that's Ooh. running in their favorite operating system or their iPads. Okay. But first, let's look at link debugging. So link debugging is one of the uh, most interesting things that we've done in Oscode version 3.0. Basically, it's the idea that using link shouldn't be a sacrifice, right? Um, when I'm right, and right now, it sort of is. Because if you write your code in this, as long link queries, mm -hmm. um, you're gaining uh, readability. You're gaining uh, uh, a much more succinct, beautiful, functional, declarative style of coding. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, if you try to f uh, step over a big link query like this one, it either finished or it threw an exception, but you have no idea what right. actually happened inside. So we're going to look at this example uh, as a link query, okay. as, and then we're going to fix the same problem using the time travel debugging experience collaboratively. So what I have here is I have a beautiful poem that I wrote, and I have a link query that's trying to find what is the word that appears most frequently inside of this poem. And we've added an assertion to show that right now there's a failure in here, because we were expecting this link algorithm to return the word bugs, but it's actually returning the word code right now. Okay. And I see that the word bugs appears one, two, three, four four times, but the word code only appears one, two, three times. Mm -hmm. So this definitely should have been the word bugs. And I needed to figure out what happened here. So if I didn't have Oz code, what I'd probably do is I'd either try to split this up, or sometimes I'd just go ahead and rewrite this entire for each loop, just as a, uh, this entire link statement to just a bunch of for each loops, mm -hmm. just so that I can figure out what happened, right? I can step through it. Um, but rather than doing all of that, we're going to use the Oz code link debugging experience. So you see here that right now I have these annotations that are telling me how many items came from each part of the link query. Now these numbers, uh, already as part of Oscon version 3.0, they're already part of the live coding experience. So if I change my link query while I'm debugging, um, these numbers will update in real time. And we'll see that in just a moment. But the first thing I'll do is I'll just click on this guy. And now I'm inside the link debugging mode. Okay? Mm -hmm. And when I'm inside link debugging mode, Oscode basically shows me a visualization for each item, how it traveled through the link pipeline. So we see, for example, we begin with 99, which is the very first word in our poem here. Mm -hmm. And we see that 99 came from split. Then the where clause returned true. Then we group by the word itself, and then we order by how many times it appeared in the poem. So we see that 99 appears 1, 2. That's why this lambda expression here returned the number 2. So we order by the count, and then we take the last uh, one. Okay. Right? Yep. Uh, 
Right. So ne the next thing I can do here is I can do this sor same sort of time travel that's already available in Oscars version 3.0 uh, through the link statement. So for example, I can click anywhere in here, and this visualization will update to show me how that particular item traveled through the link pipeline. Mm -hmm. For example, if I select this string empty, I see that the where clause returned false, and that's why it didn't carry on through to the rest of the link pipeline. Okay. Or if I want to, I can look at the where clause, and I can decide if I want to see the 79 items that came in or the 29 items that came out of the where operator, right? Yeah. And these red-green indicators on the right-hand side tell me which ones uh, the, the where predicate returned true on and which one it returned false on. Mm -hmm. Now, we still haven't solved this bug, so I'm going to go need some more information. And I'm going to do that by opening up the link analysis window, which I can access by clicking this button right here or clicking that button right over there as well. And what the link analysis window will do, it will basically just show me uh, the before and after of each operator. So I've got my split, I've got where, I've got group by. Right now I'm looking at group by. On the left hand side, I'm seeing everything that came in. Mm -hmm. And on the right hand side, I'm seeing everything that came out. Now I can click anywhere I want and see what happened to those items, right? So the only thing I know about this issue is that it has something to do with the word bugs. That was the word that we expected to get out of this. Yeah. So I type in bugs. And I'm going to go ahead and do a filtering. Now, now I can immediately see yeah. the problem, right? So I see that I've got these three instances of the word bugs going inside of this group, but I've got another instance of the word bugs that's going into an entirely different group. Right. So I actually have two problems here. First, I need to take care of the casing issue, right? I don't care if it's all lowercase or uppercase. It's still mm -hmm. the same word. And I also need to remove that closing parenthesis at the end. So let's go ahead and do that, but we're going to do that with live coding. So I'm going to exit the link debugging mode. And you'll notice how right now I've got 79 items coming out of split. Mm -hmm. But as soon as I add those missing separators, whoops, those missing separators, boom. Now we've got 81 items coming through here. The numbers updated as soon as I lift my fingers off the keyboard. And you also do notice that right now I've got 19 items coming from the group by because the lowercase and the uppercase are going into different groups. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to go ahead and fix that as well by saying select i goes to i to lower. Boom, now we've got 18 mm. items. So let's just visually verify that we fix, indeed, we fixed this bug. I'm going to open up the link analysis window one more time. And I'm going to go to that uppercase word bugs right at the bottom here, which was the one that was causing us problems. Now you'll notice these animations here. Where I, when I go to, from the where to the select, you see how the animation sort of shows me the flow of the link query. So we see that the uppercase okay. word bugs became lowercase. And then we go to the group by. We see that this time around, we've got one, two, three, four items coming in. We go to order by. Now we see the, bef the before and the after, right? So this is yep. not sorted, and this is sorted. And now bugs is the last one, as we expected. So now when we hit F10, we see that indeed we solved the problem. Very, very cool. Cool. So one of the other things we've recently added to this uh, functionality is two things. First, we added uh, support for iQueryables. So this now works with Linked Entity Framework, Linked to SQL, and all of that. Okay. Um, the other thing we added, which is pretty cool, is this new pin button up here. So again, this window shows you the before and after of each operator. Um, but let's say you want to see uh, for each one of these uh, items that were already sorted, um, what uh, item they came from originally, right? So this pin button will allow me to select any chunk of the link query. And it's sort of like the same thing you do when you have a bug in a SQL statement, right? If you have a bug in a SQL statement, you try to break it into smaller parts and see what the flow of information was at each mm -hmm. one of those parts. The pin button will allow you to do that with just one click. So now when I've pinned it here, I'm, I'm seeing this entire chunk of the link query that's highlighted here. So I see on the left-hand side, I'm seeing the initial words that came here from split. And on the right-hand side, I'm seeing the groups after they were already sorted with the order by. So I can see what items came, came inside of which group from the very uh, beginning of the query before we even filtered it out the empty strings and so on and so forth. Nice. Cool. So now, let's talk about the collaborative debugging experience. So um, I'm going to talk to you about a really exciting new product that we're coming out with, mm -hmm. which is the Oscode Cloud Debugger. And what that does is it basically allows me to share uh, debugging sessions where I'm trying to figure out a bug. And 
that's really, in my opinion, one of the most frustrating things about debugging in that um, nowadays we have amazing collaboration on code in GitHub pull yep. requests and issues and VSTS pull requests where we can zoom in on every last line of code and nitpick and scrutinize and make sure we collaboratively, collaboratively work as a team mm -hmm. uh, to bake in quality into our code base. Um, but for debugging, we don't have an equivalent for that right now. And what this means is that oftentimes you get assigned a bug and right away you have to do a lot of research, right? You have to figure out where to put the breakpoint, you try to put a breakpoint here, try to put a breakpoint there. You gain a lot of insight into uh, where the code is, where the bug is hiding, what bits of code are involved, but sometimes you just figure out that, okay, well, actually this is uh, part of the code base that I don't own personally and I'm not familiar enough, mm -hmm. I'm just going to go ahead and assign this bug to somebody else. And at that point, all of your knowledge and all of your insight about what the state of the system was uh, in, uh, and what was that all-elusive all uh, chain of, of consequences that happened that led up to the bug, all of that effort you spent basically dies and go to software effort heaven, yeah. along with all of the time we spend at the beginning of the sprint planning out how much time each thing is going to take, not taking into account the fact that we're going to spend about you know two more weeks uh, with all these bugs that we can't really account for and we don't know how long that's going to take. Mm -hmm. um, so what we've done is we created a tool that does to debugging what GitHub does to coding. And I'll show you that right now. Okay. So we are now uh, working inside of a company called Poetry Tech. It's a hip new startup from San Francisco that makes all these exciting algorithms for analyzing poetry. And this is the part where I get to claim my long lost dream of being a Hollywood actor because I'm going to role play as all three of these characters. Okay. Um, and our story starts with Bill. He's the DevOps guy. He's the one who got the call from the customer. That it turns out that our uh, algorithm, which is supposed to find the most frequent word in each, in each poem, is actually failing for a customer. And they're calling us on the phone and they're very, very upset. So we're going to go here. Actually, first off, what Bill does is he um, needs to create a repo. And he's inside of Visual Studio. And he went ahead and created a repo, a repro scenario for this bug. So what we see here. Let's actually look at this without the debugger first. So what we see here is that uh, they're using a different version of the finding most frequent wor word algorithm. This one is not using link or functional programming. It's written imperatively. So what we do is we basically just split the string like we did before. Um, and then we check. If it's not a string empty, we keep a dictionary around mm -hmm. that's uh, going to count uh, how, many how many occurrences of each word we have. If the word already appears, we just plus one it. And if it doesn't, we initialize it to one. That's simple enough. So we, um, I'm really sorry, but I already totally spoil, gave you major spoilers already. You probably already know what the issue is here. But hey, at least it's not Game of Thrones, right? Yeah. Um, but what Bill does is he finds the problem. And uh, he, he finds the, the, the repro. He added an assertion uh, so that um, his colleagues, can, uh, the, the, the devs, can actually see what the issue was. Mm -hmm. And he went ahead and clicked the Share button. Okay. So wait, a share button inside yeah. of Visual Studio mm. Debugger? What does that mean? So what, when you click this guy, what it does is it immediately opens up this web interface where you can actually see what the code uh, did. And it's telling us, you are now viewing an actual execution that occurred on Bill's machine. You can change the code to experiment and create a what if scenario. Hmm. So that's really interesting. So I can actually log in here from my favorite uh, browser and see what the code was doing. And, uh, and I see that Bill from DevOps uh, helpfully added this assertion so that we can actually see what the problem was. And I um, now need to fix it. Now, what uh, actually happened behind the scenes as soon as you click that share button is that Oscode went ahead and both uploaded just the relevant bits of the information. And in the background, it also updated uh, a dump of the program into the cloud. Okay, And what that means is that now you can do actual the same exact uh, debugging experience I showed you in Oscode version 4 inside your, your browser. So now what we're going to do here, so Bill handed the, the bug off to Jim. And Jim is a junior C-sharp developer. 
So he looks at the code and he tries to figure out. He sees that he has the same uh, functionality that we had before, where you can actually hover over things and you can have a data tip so we can see what split method return. And, and he's in the browser right but now, it's not in Visual Studio. Exactly. We're in the browser. And that's what's going to allow us to collaborate on this bug. So I can hover over. Did you have to write that capability yourself? or? Yes. Yeah, so this okay. is the Ozcode Cloud Debugger. OK. Yeah. Wow. So um, what we see here is that we have all the same functionality that I showed you before. I can time travel and all, all of that. But Bill is a junior C Sharp developer, and he doesn't quite uh, understand the bug. So he's going to need some help. So he's going to uh, uh, write a comment here and say, hey, Joan, which and Joan is Jim's supervisor, um, can't quite figure out what's going on here. The only thing that looks fishy is the last occurrence, well, I'm not even going to try uh, to spell that one, uh, the last iteration of the word. And then he wants to show Joan that this instance of the word bugs right here looks a bit fishy. So he's going to click this button that says comment. And he actually created a, a link to that mm. particular variable value. Um, what do you think? So now what we're doing. Uh, Jim hands off the bug to Joan. And Joan is a senior architect on the team. She's Jim's supervisor. She gets a notification via email that Jim needs help. Mm -hmm. And she's going to jump back in to the browser. Um, and now, whoops. And now I'm logged in as Joan here. And Joan looks at the code. She hovers over this thing that says we've got 79 iterations of this for each loop. She knows she needs to search for the word bugs, because that's the thing that's causing the problem. And now when she clicks on this instance, uh, we do time travel debugging again to this instance of the word bugs. And we see that on the first iteration of the word bugs, um, we updated the dictionary to just one, as we expected. And then when we go to the second iteration, we updated it to two, as we expected. Uh, then on the third iteration, you see this, this animation is showing you what mm -hmm. changed when you slip between, between iterations. So we went from two to three. Uh, and, th and then on the very last iteration, uh, what, we do, what we do here is because it's not the same word, we see that um, it updated a different word into one. Okay. Okay? So now that Joan understands this, she wants to tell Jim what's up. So she says, hey, Jim. Indeed, the problem is that the last iteration wasn't added. And she creates a link here. Uh, but the former iterations, and we'll, we'll say uh, here that it's because, whoops, because it's uppercase. So she can actually yep. explain the issue. But the former iterations, and she can just go ahead and create a, a point in time link. So I'm going to go back in time to this instance of the word bugs, and then create a link to that particular point in time. Uh, but the former iteration um, was lowercase and had a trailing closing parenthesis. Please fix, and let's see how it goes. OK, so now that we've done that, Joan sends her comment. And we're back to Jim. Now Jim, now that we're logged in as, as Jim, Jim sees that she added this comment. And he can click on these, uh, these links. And what that does is it highlights the points nice. in time that Joan has pointed out, right? So he can, when he clicks this one, it goes back to that iteration and shows me the lowercase word bugs. And when I click on that iteration, it shows me the other one. Now, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and fix this bug as, uh, as Jim. So I'm going to go ahead here and add those missing separators like we did before. OK. Now. Um, as soon as I did that, it updated to show me now there are 81 instances in this uh, array. And now I'm going to also have to add the to lower right here. Whoops, word dot to lower. And if you look down here at the bottom, uh, we will see that now we fixed the bug, right? The word has changed to the lowercase word bugs, and the problem is solved. Wow. 
I'm going to go ahead and propose these changes so that Joan can have a look at them. So I click on Propose Changes. Oscar shows me the diff viewer so I can see what was changed. I said, yeah. OK, looks good. Now we're going to go back to Joan. And Joan's going to need to approve this bug fix. And then we can even merge it into master and immediately let our continuous deployment pipeline uh, take, the rest, take the rest from there. So we're going to go back to Joan, um, logged in as Joan again. And I can see that Jim proposed code changes just now. I can click on View Execution. And then Osco tells me we are now viewing a speculative what if analysis based on changes that Jim has proposed. And I can always go back from looking at the, uh, the, original, the, the original execution of the code and the execution that has Jim's fixes with it. Mm -hmm. Once I'm content that the bug fix is good, I can click on Review Changes. I can see, as Joan, I can see the changes that Jim made. And now I've got two options. Um, Osco tells me that these changes have no conflicts, with, co no conflicts with the master branch, and I can merge them automatically. So if I click Approve Bug Fix, it just immediately merges them, and we can take our continuous, let our continuous deployment take it from there. If I want to, though, I can just click this button right here. And what that will do is it will create a patch file, and if I'll get the apply these changes lo locally in Visual Studio. The Oscode extension set of Visual Studio will pick up on that, and I can just uh, apply them into whatever uh, branch I am on, on right now. But Joan is just going to click on Approve Bug Fix. We see that these code changes have been approved by Joan and merged into master. She says, great job, Jim. And Ta-da! We are done. And so does that, that's amazing, does that assume, oh, what happened? Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, so does that assume a particular version of source code, particular CI, CD pipeline? OK, so th that's a great question. So what that does, right now it's working against uh, Git. So you can use it on GitHub. You can use it on uh, Visual Studio Online. Um, and another nice thing is that this can actually uh, show you uh, in the future, as long as you uh, um, actually connect Oscode to your source control, okay. um, which you can elect to do or you can choose not to do. It's up to you. Uh, but if you do decide to do that, then Oscode will actually know uh, to give you um, um, go to definition and even IntelliSense because it will pick up on your entire uh, solution structure and so forth. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. And now this is the best part. Everything that I showed you about the Oscode Cloud Debugger, and we're announcing this right here, right now, on Visual right. Studio Toolbox, is completely open source for okay. .NET open source community can just take advantage of this absolutely free. So what it does is it actually goes ahead and detects whether the code you are uh, debugging is against uh, a GitHub or uh, a repository that's open source. And if it is, then you can just use this completely for free, and we'll allow you to collaborate wow. on your debugging session. So does it create pull requests? Um, right now, what the button you did is it automatically merges into a branch. We're okay. also considering having another option where, where you can actually create a pull request with one Got click. It. OK. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Thank you so much. And when's this, uh, this is available now? No. It's so this coming. Is, this is uh, currently something that uh, uh, we're working on. We're going to announce a public preview soon, okay. just a preview. Uh, and we'd love to hear feedback from the community uh, if they like it, what we can improve upon it even further. Uh, we're also working on integration into uh, VSTS so mm -hmm. that. Uh, you know, uh, even uh, enabling such radical uh, uh, scenarios where if we have a VSTS continuous integration set up and the unit test fails, let's just jump right into this debugging session yeah. and see what the failure was, stuff like that. That's so fantastic. there's a lot of endless possibilities of where we're going to take this technology. Wow, that is great stuff. Thank you. All right. So uh, folks should, will have links in the show notes on where to get the latest version, where they can get more information on what's coming. It's great stuff. OK, hope you enjoyed that. Uh, definitely worth checking out this great tool. And we will see you next time on Visual Studio Toolbox.